Hey guys, welcome to section 2.4, where today we're going to take a look at the real zeros of polynomials. Now this is actually just day one. We're going to be spending a couple different days here, working through, uh, kind of reminding ourselves of how long and synthetic division work, and then really adding on to that. Um, there are a variety of new theorems over the course of 2.4, and I wanted to introduce three of those today. So after we kind of review how to do long and synthetic division, um, we're going to look at the remainder theorem, the factor theorem, and finally the rational roots theorem to better understand some of these deeper connections regarding polynomials. Okay, so let's get started. So number one here, it says to use long division to divide 3x cubed plus 5x squared plus 8x plus 7 by the binomial uh, 3x plus 2. And additionally, we're going to factor that out. So there are a couple ways to write this out. Um, let's go ahead and start off just by dividing it and kind of working through that process. Okay, so we're going to bring down our terms, and what's nice about these is you'll notice we don't skip over any degree. This is degree 3, 2, 1, 0, and therefore I don't have to worry about any sort of placeholders, okay? So 3x cubed plus a 5x squared plus 8x plus 7. And I am dividing in 3x plus 2. So <clears throat> first of all, 3x times what is going to be a 3x cubed? Well, it's just going to be an x squared. So we're going to begin there. x squared times 3x is a 3x cubed. And x squared times 2 gives us a 2x squared. We now subtract that off following our traditional uh, left to right division algorithm. And by subtracting this, of course, those reduce. 5x squared minus 2x squared is a 3x squared. And now we can bring down the 8x. For the moment, that's the only two terms that we're going to need um, because these are separated by one degree, as are these. So 3x times what is 3x squared? We're going to need an x, a positive x. So let's multiply that in. We're going to get a 3x squared plus 2x, and I can subtract that off. Once again, these reduce. 8x minus 2x is going to be 6x, and now I can bring down my last term, my constant. 3x times what is 6x? Well, that's going to be a positive 2. So we multiply that out, we get a 6x plus 4, and once we subtract it, these are gone, and we get a positive 3, okay? So what that positive 3 really indicates is that we have a remainder of 3. Okay, and we'll talk about what that means as we write out our final kind of solutions. Okay, so to begin, it said divide this. Okay, so fundamentally what we did, this is kind of the first way to, to talk about finding a quotient, is to take the polynomial, 3x cubed, so on and so forth, and then divide it by 3x plus 2, and then we said our result was x squared plus x plus 2, x squared plus x plus 2, but this remainder of 3 indicates that it didn't divide in evenly, right? So what that means is I'm left with 3 over a 3x plus 2. So I can add on a 3 over a 3x plus 2, and that's kind of what our, our remainders are always going to look like, okay? <clears throat> now, alternatively, we could have just factored a 3x plus 2 out to kind of indicate the overall same structure of the equation. Okay. Now, obviously, by dividing this in, we're saying that x cannot equal a negative 2 thirds. Um, and it certainly shouldn't, given that we don't have a remainder of 0. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but fundamentally, that would be like one, one structural detail of, uh, of this division. Okay. Let's take a look at number 2 next. For number 2, we're saying we are uh, factoring this out. And really what that means is we're basically just multiplying the 3x plus 2 back to the right side. So it's an alternative method of rewriting our original uh, trinomial. I'm sorry, it's not a, tr a trinomial. Our cubic polynomial. So we have 3x cubed plus 5x squared plus 8x plus 7. And this is equal to, if I multiply this to all my terms, 3x plus 2 times the first three terms, I can rewrite. And it will absolutely appear to have just been factored out. But then when I multiply it to my last term, you'll notice it reduces with the denominator. So I can just write a plus 3, which indicates our remainder. Okay? So like I said, a couple different ways to write out our solution or to sort of consider what this polynomial kind of looks like in the end. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now let's kind of remind ourselves of how synthetic division works. Okay? It says use synthetic division to find all zeros of the function 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 5x minus 12. Well, because they don't tell us where to begin, the first thing I'm going to choose to do is to simply plug this into my calculator and come up with a reasonable estimate for what might be the root. 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 5x minus 12. 
if I look at my standard viewing window, well, it appears that we're hitting at three. And we can test that by plugging in second trace or checking with second trace. We'll look for our zero. We'll hit the left bound just left of that and the right bound. There we have it. And yeah, it is in fact showing up as three zero. Okay. <clears throat> now, I'm going to go ahead and zoom out a little farther. And just look at uh, a larger viewing window. And what you'll notice way down here is that we actually see this sort of double curvature behavior. Um, you're not going to get more than a couple of those, a couple of those curves, or I should say local extrema, based on a cubic. Um, broadly speaking, the, the highest number of extrema that you can have, local extrema, local maximums and minimums, is one less than the degree of the function. And so since this is a cubic, and I already see a local maximum and a local minimum, that means I won't have any more, and therefore I'm not gonna have any additional real roots here, because this behavior to the left has to continue, and to the right really has to continue, okay? All right, <clears throat> so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna test that. After all, we just said it looks like, dot, 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 x equals three, okay? So let's go ahead and try this using our synthetic division. Just like with long division, we want to make sure that we don't need any placeholders because we have a cubic, quartic, linear, and constant. So this is going to be uh, just looking at the coefficients, really those numbers, and I guess in the, the last case, a sub zero, the constant. So two, negative three, negative five, and negative 12. We draw sort of an inverted division box, and we're testing three, so we put it on the outside. We always drop down our first coefficient, drop down two, multiply by three, and we get six. Now we add these two numbers, okay? Negative three plus six is three, multiply by three again, we get nine. Add these two, negative five plus nine is four, multiply by three, we're gonna get 12, add these two, we're gonna get zero, okay? So what that tells me is that there is a remainder of zero, and as a result, x minus three, the binomial containing the zero x equals three is in fact a factor, okay? Um, with no remainder uh, left. Now it said to find all zeros. So let's also consider what else just happened here. So we can say x equals three is in fact one of our zeros. But what else just happened is the fact that we, we just reduced degree of our polynomial by one. This was a cubic, quadratic, linear, constant, and because I divided by x to the first, uh, essentially, using synthetic division, this is now degree 2, degree 1, and a constant. So we're looking at 2x squared plus 3x plus 4. So given that we're trying to find zeros of the quadratic that are remaining, we already know that these should appear as imaginary numbers based on our graphical analysis a moment ago. We can go ahead and apply either completing the square method or we can apply um, the quadratic formula. So why don't we go ahead and go with the latter this time. X is equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. All right, so at this stage, we're going to get 9 minus, this is uh, 32. So this comes out as negative 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 23 all over 4. And the only additional thing that we really have to do here, since 23 is prime, is to simplify that radical of a negative as an imaginary number. So 3 plus or minus i root 23 all over 4, okay? And there we have it. So we just found our first root that was uh, purely real. We found our next two roots that had imaginary components. Let me just remind you that even though that this is real and these have imaginary components, these are all complex numbers, right? Just like we talked about day one. Um, this, for instance, is the complex number 3 plus 0i. So there's nothing wrong with saying that all three of your roots are guaranteed to be complex, right? It's just some of them have imaginary components and some do not. Some are purely real. All right. <clears throat> Without further ado, let's take a look at some of our new theorems, okay? We're going to take a look at the remainder theorem to start off with. And to kind of show you the, the foundation of how this works, I want to start off by looking at synthetic division because fundamentally <clears throat> we're not going to apply that every single time, okay? So it says find the remainder when f of x is equal to 3x squared plus 7x minus 20 when it's divided by x minus 2. Now what the remainder theorem tells us 
is that if a polynomial is divided by a linear binomial, which is what we see here, x minus k, then the remainder is r equals f of k. All right? So if I plug in k, which in this case, x minus k, k would equal 2. I think we can all agree on that. If I were to plug in 2 to my original polynomial, I should get the exact same value as an output from my synthetic remainder. Okay? So let's try it with the synthetic division first. We've got 3, 7, negative 20. Let's try this 0 potential root of uh, x minus 2, and therefore the 0 of 2. We drop our 3, we multiply, add, multiply, and add. So what this tells me is that 2 is not a 0 of the function. Okay. Now let's see what happens when instead I just plug in f of 2. f of 2 is equal to 3 times a 2 squared plus 7 times 2 minus 20. 3 times 2 squared, that's 4 times 3 is 12. 7 times 2 is 14. 12 plus 14 is 24. <clears throat> I'm sorry, 12 plus 14 is 26. Minus 20 is 6. Okay? And what you'll notice is that the remainder is the output for input 2. Okay? Kind of a cool connection. That whatever remainder we get is actually telling us whether or not this point is above the x-axis or below it. In this case, we have a positive output, so that means that it's going to be above the x-axis. Okay? Looking at this cubic, or this, uh, this quadratic, if I plug in 2, 1, 2, we get an output of 6. So obviously that is above the x-axis. Okay? That's kind of what this, this first piece is showing. <clears throat> All right, so moving forward, we're not going to continue using synthetic division because we know that this method uh, will continue to work out. After all, it's a theorem that we're applying. <clears throat> so we've got x plus 1. In that case, k would equal negative 1, right? Because it's always x minus k. And all I'm going to do is plug that in. So f of negative 1 is equal to we have a 3 times a negative 1 squared plus 7 times negative 1 minus 20. This gives us 3 minus 7 minus 20. And therefore, we're going to end up with a negative 24. So I know the point, negative 1, negative 24, lies on this graph. I also know that, it, that this is, of course, not a root. Okay. In the case of x plus 4, k would equal negative 4. Let's go ahead and try it. So f of negative 4 is equal to 3 times negative 4 squared plus 7 times negative 4 minus 20. So negative 4 squared, we're going to get 16. 16 times 3, we end up at 48. Minus 24, uh, 28 minus 20. Well, that comes out perfectly as 0. And what that tells me is that negative 4 is, in fact, a root, or rather a 0 of the function. x plus 4 is a root of the quadratic. Okay, So kind of two different ways to talk about the same thing. All right? So let's think about this. It says the direct result of the special case, f of k equals 0, that's kind of what we just saw, is what we call the factor theorem. So a polynomial f of x has a factor x minus k if and only if f of k is equal to 0. This is sort of an application of this last example. Okay? So let's apply this idea to the previous example by applying long or synthetic division. So we're really just talking about part c here. Okay? So if I apply long division, um, it would be that I'm dividing x plus 4 into my quadratic. 3x squared plus 7x minus 20. And I think we can all agree what we're looking for in both of these cases will be to not get a remainder, or rather get a remainder of 0. Okay? So x times what is 3x squared? That would be 3x. We multiply it out. 3x squared plus 12x. Subtract it off. We're going to get a negative 5x here. Please reduce. Bring down your negative 20. x times what is negative 5x? That's a negative 5. We get a negative 5x minus 20. But when I subtract that off, I get 0. Because there's a remainder of 0, we know that x minus, or x minus negative 4, x plus 4 in this case, uh, is therefore a factor of the polynomial f of x, this 3x squared plus 7x minus 20. Um, if instead we wanted to do um, synthetic division, I think a lot of us find this faster. We use negative 4 right on in with 3 and 7 and negative 20. Drop the 3, multiply, add, multiply, 
add. And again, what this tells me, because I'm getting a remainder of zero, is that this factor, x minus four, factors perfectly into our polynomial, three x squared plus seven x minus 20. And again, you'll notice this stands for a three x minus five. The degree dropped, just like we got a three x minus five here. So let's talk about the only real stipulation where synthetic division isn't going to help us. If you choose to divide in larger polynomials rather than just linear factors, um, we cannot use synthetic division. This only applies when you're saying this is the very specific root of a single linear factor, okay? In the case of degree two, degree three, degree four, we really have to stick to uh, long division, okay? Because alternatively, it would be the same as multiple synthetic division steps, okay? So just be cautious there, okay? These aren't always interchangeable, but they are in the case of linear factors, okay? All right. So hopefully those are starting to make sense to you. And let's wrap up the day with what we call the rational roots theorem, okay? So here's what we're told. It says, suppose f is a polynomial function of degree n is greater than or equal to one, okay? So we can in fact have linear polynomials or degree two, quadratic, degree three, cubic, so on and so forth, okay? And it says with every coefficient an integer and the constant, this a sub zero on the end, cannot be zero. That's an important part of this specific theorem. Okay? You can't apply the rational roots theorem if it's not. Okay? <clears throat> and then it says if x is equal to p over q is a rational zero of f, where p and q have no common integer factors other than positive or negative one, then p is an integer factor of the constant coefficient a sub zero. So really what we're saying is p can be basically all the factors of your constant and q is an integer factor of the leading coefficient a sub n, q will be an integer factor of your leading coefficient, okay? So in case it helps you, feel free to just write in constant versus lead coefficient. That's kind of where these come from. I'm not saying they're the exact same things as those. It's just where we can get the values, okay? <clears throat> now before we continue, I want to kind of point out the potential issues here. Um, in fact, I think in the book it calls this the rational zeros theorem. I think they used to call it the rational roots theorem. Um, the fundamental idea is that you're finding possible zeros, okay? Roots are officially like the factors that factor out of the polynomials, okay? So we're going to call this the rational zeros theorem. Just growing up, I always called it the rational roots theorem. That's kind of what I was taught, okay? <coughs> it's important to remember that we can have a variety of zeros, okay? Now we know that they are all complex numbers, okay? So that's kind of the big overarching heading, okay? They're all complex automatically because real numbers, imaginary numbers, you can always write these as complex values, okay? <clears throat> now in the case of real, we have a few different options. Real can have either rational or irrational. As you guys might have guessed, the rational zeros theorem cannot give you irrational real zeros, okay? Likewise, it can't have any with an imaginary component. Imaginary, there we go, that's non-zero, okay? So it can't help you in these cases, but it can help us to start breaking these down using rational roots. So it's giving us like one more tool in our toolbox to start breaking down some tougher polynomials, okay? So in case number one, it says find the rational roots of f of x equals x cubed minus 2x squared plus 1. Now you'll notice there's no linear term here. This is a cubic, quadratic, and a constant, okay? So find the rational roots here. We're going to take positive or negative p over q. So it's basically saying what are all the options? These are the integer factors of the constant, which are, is just 1. So this is positive, negative, 1 over and the integer factors of the lead coefficient, which is also one. So what that means is that we can only have a positive one or a negative one as our possible rational zeros, okay? Now let's go ahead and just use our calculator and see which it is, okay? That should always make things a lot simpler for us. So. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and plug this in. x cubed minus 2x to the second plus 1. 
Now, I do want to point out that this is not absolutely necessary because one option, in fact, let, let's do it the algebraic approach. On the front page, we just said that if these are, in fact, uh, zeros, then when I plug them in, I get a value of zero back, don't I? So if I go ahead and try this with f of 1, let's see what we get. f of 1 is equal to 1 cubed minus 2 times 1 squared plus 1. And so what we get there is 1 minus 2 plus 1, 1 minus 2 plus 1 is 0. So we know that positive 1 works. Let's try it with negative 1. In the case of negative 1, in fact, I can guarantee you it's not going to work because irrational numbers have to pair up to make rational um, coefficients, which is what we see here, and imaginary numbers have to pair up. So I can already kind of guarantee you guys we can't get one more rational uh, zero because we already have one of our three taken, and that would mean that the third would have to be imaginary or irrational. So let's just go ahead and show that to ourselves now. f of negative 1, it's not going to work out. Negative 1 cubed minus 2 times a negative 1 squared plus 1. Well, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. Negative 2 times positive 1 is negative 2 plus 1. And there we have it. We get this output of negative 2. So that means negative 1 is not, in fact, a rational 0. Okay? So find the, the rational roots. We've done it. It's literally just positive 1. x equals 1. Okay? As far as remaining roots, <clears throat> what you'll find after you've plugged this in, there we go. Let me go ahead and do zoom standard. A little bit easier to see that way. What you'll find after you plug it in is that, yes, we do in fact have three distinct uh, points that we cross at. So what that tells me is that the two remaining are also real zeros. They just both happen to be irrational. Okay? And if you really cared to find them, all you'd really have to do is uh, use synthetic division or long division to break this down using the zero you know, and then take that quadratic. Because after we reduce the degree by 1, this is now degree 2, you can then go about using a quadratic formula, or you can go about using, um, uh, well, not factoring, of course, but you could use uh, completing the square alternatively. Okay? All right. Now, I'd really like you guys to try number two on your own um, using the theorems that we've talked about so far today. It says find the rational roots of the following. I'm going to go one step farther, and I'm just going to try to find all roots. Okay? So be they rational or not, be they imaginary, um, that's okay. All right? So why don't you go ahead and try that. Pause the video here. See what you come up with. All right. So possible rational roots rational zeros using the rational zeros theorem. Positive negative p over q is going to look like a plus minus. Now p can only be 2 or 1 over q can only be 3 or 1. These are the integer factors of our constant and our leading coefficient respectively. Okay? So now let's think about what could happen here. Okay? Possible options would include 2 over 3 positive or negative 2 thirds, 2 over 1, positive or negative 2, 1 over 3, positive or negative 1 third, and 1 over 1, positive or negative 1. So at this stage, we've eliminated an infinite number of rational zeros, and we basically say that for this cubic, it can only have rational zeros in this list of eight total numbers. Okay. Um, it's a really nice tool to, to kind of give you guys some cleaner options here, okay? So <clears throat> what we can do, we could try these individually. We could go about plugging them in. What I always recommend is to simply graph it to begin with, and then you should be able to quickly tell which ones to test, okay? So to show your work algebraically, this kind of supports your work, right? I'm not going to allow you to just say, well, my calculator, excuse the bell, my calculator spit out this number. So what I would always recommend here is once you come up with that list, 3x cubed plus 4x squared minus 5x minus 2. Once we come up with our list, <clears throat> we can narrow it down even further using what we see. Okay? So based on what I'm seeing here, I would only test negative 2, uh, what appears to be negative 1 third, and positive 1. Okay? So let's start off with 
honing in on some of those. So we said negative 2, negative 1 third, and positive 1. Those are the three that we really want to test. Okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at f of, ah, well, let's start off with the easy one, f of 1. Okay? Always start off with the easiest one to plug in because as you go, you're going to make this simpler and simpler to test. Okay? Because, um, of course, we can divide it out, too. So f of 1 is equal to 3 times a 1 cubed plus 4 times a 1 squared minus 5 times 1 minus 2. Well, that's just 3 plus 4, 7, minus 5 minus 2, which is, of course, 0. So x equals 1 is one of our rational roots. Okay? Now, if we wanted to simplify this, we could. Alternatively, you can just go about plugging in more and more values and kind of see what happens. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and just do that. f of negative 2 is equal to 3 times a negative 2 cubed plus 4 times negative 2 squared minus 5 times negative 2 minus 2. Negative 2 cubed is going to be negative 8 times 3 is going to be a negative 24. 4 times this is going to be 4 is going to give us 16. Negative 5 times negative 2 is going to be a positive 10. And then take away 2. Well, that's 26, and this is negative 26. So, of course, we get 0. And as a result, we say x equals negative 2 is our second rational root. Okay? Finally, let's try this negative 1 third. f of negative 1 third is equal to 3 times negative 1 third cubed plus 4 times negative 1 third squared minus 5 times negative 1 third minus 2. So at this stage, negative 1 third to the third is going to give us negative 1 27th times 3 gives us negative 1 ninth. Negative 1 third squared is going to be positive 1 ninth times 4 is going to be positive 4 ninths. Negative 5 times negative a third is going to be a positive 5 thirds. And finally, take away 2. Well, I'm going to need some common denominators here, so I'm going to multiply this by 3 over 3. Negative 1 ninth plus 4 ninths plus 15 ninths. I'll also need ninths here, so I'm going to multiply it by 9 over 9. We get negative 18 ninths. Negative 1 plus 4 is 3. 3 plus 15 is 18 minus 18 we get 0. And therefore, x equals negative a third is our third rational root. Okay? <clears throat> so this is the, the easy way to kind of break down all these different options as far as what you can and cannot tell. Okay? <clears throat> what makes this a little bit tricky is the realization that if you were not allowed to use a calculator on problems like this, you would have to actually go about testing all eight of these. Okay? So just realize that like, it, it does, in fact, uh, break down the process from infinitely many options down to a very finite number. But it doesn't make for a very fast process. Okay? All right. Well, so this was, again, this is 2.4 day one, talking about the remainder theorem, the factor theorem, and finally, the rational zeros theorem. Okay? So that kind of sums things up for the day. If you guys have any additional questions, obviously I'm happy to help you or uh, talk to you in AL. Okay? Have a good night.